Welcome to Get Up in the Cool, old time music with Cameron DeWitt and friends. This week's friend is Nick Garris. We recorded this last week at the Earful of Fiddle Music and Dance Camp in Rodney, Michigan. Again, Chris, Bruce, Nick, thank you so much for having me out. I had an amazing time. I'm stopping by Chicago before Clifftop to do a live taping of Get Up in the Cool with Genevieve Kester at the Old Town School of Folk Music on Saturday, July 27th. So, if you're in the Chicago area, register now. Also, for all you Chicagoan banjo players, I'm teaching a workshop right beforehand if you're interested. Just follow the links in the show notes for registration. I want to thank Elderly Instruments in Lansing, Michigan for sharing Get Up in the Cool online with their customers and increasing the reach of the show. Next time you need an instrument upgrade or new music gear, visit their online store at elderly.com. One more thing, there is a full video version of this episode available on YouTube and Get Up in the Cool's Facebook page. Nick is a percussive dancer, so the music is great without the visuals, but the full video experience is definitely worth it. Stick around after the interview, and I'll tell you how you can keep up with this week's amazing guest. But first, here's my interview and jam with Nick Garris. Enjoy. Garris, welcome to Get Up in the Cool. Thank you, Cameron. It's nice to be here. It's nice for me to be here with you because we're at Earful of Fiddle Music and Dance Camp. Yes. So thanks for having me. Overlooking Jensen Lake yeah. in Central Michigan in Macosta County. Are you, are you one of the founders of this camp? Cool. I didn't know the whole story because originally uh, Chris Stableford 
um, who happens to be right over there, <laughs> uh, uh, contacted me. And then when I met you at Oli Old Time, um, you said, oh, I'm so happy you're coming to our camp. And then I started to put it together. Yeah, so. Yeah, so Chris Stableford, Bruce Bowman, and I founded the camp uh, 11 years ago. Oh, wow. This is our 11th annual camp. That's so great. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. It's so nice to have you all here. The, one of the amazing and really special things about the camp is this dual focus on fiddling and percussive step dancing. Yeah. And whether that's step dancing from the Appalachian region in the United States or from Canada, because we're very close to, as you know, close to Ontario. Yeah. And we have a lot of visitors who've come to Michigan over the years from Quebec. So a lot of my teachers have been from Quebec as well. Um, or whether our, that's Irish step dancers is a really rich Irish uh, dance and music scene in this state as well. So we're at an interesting crossroads geographically speaking. Yeah. Uh, and we get to, to avail and uh, to be in conversation with all those different music and dance styles. The other great thing about being in, in Michigan in the Midwest is that there's all this Midwest old time music around. So there's yeah. Indiana music around, there's Illinois music around, some uh, musicians from Ohio. And that feels like a really special thing that this camp is trying to, um, to put forward and to share. Hmm. Um, and I'm still learning about it myself, actually. And, and, and even this year, uh, we have a fiddle player who's joining us for the first time, named Sean Ellsworth Hoffman, whose specialty is in Indiana fiddle music. So um, I got to hear a little bit of him last night. <laughs> I wish I had booked him for, to, to record him. He's so yeah, good. He yeah. sounds great. So he specializes in... Yeah, so he's giving a special topic session today about the elusive Indiana fiddler. Um, so that's it's very exciting, actually, to get to, get to bring... As you know, I, I work. I tend to work on the road a lot. I'm, mm. I'm away from Michigan most of my year, uh, but this is my time to come back and reconnect with my community and then also bring folks from outside of Michigan back. Yeah, really cool. Did you, did you grow up in Michigan? Then? Yes, very close to where we are now, actually, about a half an hour or 45 minutes from where we are now in a town called Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Mount Pleasant. And I went to school there as well, and then um, eventually moved abroad to go to grad school, and then moved back to Michigan after I finished my master's degree. And then have, have moved and, and worked in and out of the state you know, over the years. Um, I just finished an eight-month stint at the University of Edinburgh teaching on their master's degree in dance science. Yeah. Um, so that was a, an eight-month position that just wrapped up, and I, I just made the move back Welcome to back. Lansing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's nice to be back. Mm. So what was your first exposure to music? Was it as a dancer, or was it as an instrumentalist? Because I believe you... Don't you play... Uh, like bazooki or oh, you're gonna or something? Out me. Yes, I do. <laughs> I play octave mandolin. Um, yes, I play in a duo. I, play, I played for many years in a duo with Emma Beaton. Oh, really um, good. Who your listeners might know from her work with Joy Kilsaro. Yes. Uh, oh, wow. Cool. And I haven't, <laughs> I haven't brought the instrument with me this weekend because there's so much dancing to do. But, yes. Um, but yeah, no, my, my first exposure to music was probably um, because I grew up at a camp. So it's actually fitting we're at a camp. And I you grew up at a camp? I grew up at a camp. Yeah, my parents ran a YMCA camp. Oh, wow. Not not very far from where we are right now. Yeah. And uh, You just lived on site. Yeah, we lived above the kitchen. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, so there was music around. There was lots of people coming through who played music. And, you yeah. know, summer camps, there's sort of a, a culture of people making music in a, in a beautiful kind of do-it-yourself way yeah. um, where music becomes a means of socialization in a nice way yeah. um, so that was around a bit um, though I couldn't tell you if that music was you know indicative of a particular like geography or sure. I don't you know I don't know that we had like um, people who were like I don't know old-time musicians there or bluegrass musicians or uh, jazz musicians um, but one of the things that I um, remember about being at that camp is that there was like there was always kind of music happening and then um, eventually that led to us going to this festival we learned about this festival through some of the people who were at the camp and that festival was the Wheatland Music Festival yeah which is not it doesn't take place very far from where we are now there's two big events a year but there's actually events all throughout the year and it's it's a huge event I mean um, between 12 and 15,000 people come every fall. That's so many people. Is it, <laughs> is it all traditional music there? there? It's interesting. Wheatland has a... Um, they've developed a program where they have budget items for different genres. Yeah. So there's always a band, you know, to represent people from uh, the Celtic countries, you know, or from Ireland. Yeah. Um, or from Scotland. Uh, or... You know, there's maybe a, a, always a Zydeco band. There's always a Cajun band. Sure. And one of the cool things about the festival is that they also, they always have a, um, a certain um, investment in having dance. 
So it, it's not a f complete festival in their roster if there's not a, you know, a, a old-time band, a bluegrass band, a Cajun band, and a dance act. Yeah. Which is really rare for a festival, uh, Unfortunately, I think. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think growing up in that culture, um, you know, that was the first place that I saw traditional dance from the Appalachian region, traditional dance from Quebec, step dancing from England, or Irish step dancing or Shanos dancing. And that was my first um, exposure to all that stuff. Um, and it was at one of their um, their weekends, an instructional weekend called Traditional Arts Weekend. And actually, it was uh, a performance by Ira Bernstein. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, he was working with uh, Joe Herman. Um, so they were working in, as a duo. That's a great like first impression. It yeah. was. It was a great wow. first impression. And great. I, I, I seem to remember we were in a pavilion set of semi-outdoor space. And we were seated on the floor around, and Ira came out and danced on the floor. So, so it was in the round, which is, which is funny to me because like I, I'm really interested in, um, in work now that kind of maybe asks questions outside of the proscenium space, outside sure. of theater sure. spaces. And so it's funny that my first experiences, you know, were in that kind of three-sided or in the round experience. Um, and as I encountered, you know, dance and music for the first time. Um, so seeing that, I took my first class the next day. You know, you roll out of your tent at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sure. And yeah. you go to your first clogging class. And my first, one of my first dance teachers is actually here. She she teaches for your full of fiddle um, every year. And we're, we're really lucky to have her. her was name that Sheila? Sheila Graziano, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. Who's a, a dancer and a dance collector based in the Ann Arbor area. Uh, and so I took a class with her and another dancer named Connie Jo Ferguson at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And How old were you? Eight. Eight. Eight years old. Hmm. Uh and I had done a little bit of dancing before. My parents told me that I needed to do something because uh, they, they said I needed more exercise and was reading too much. <laughs> um, so they had signed me up for dance classes at a, a, a kind of strip mall dance studio um, run by two really amazing and generous teachers named Sam Williams and Lisa Williams. What kind of dancing were you doing? I was in a tap class then. Yeah. And that was in the fall. So that, that must have been uh, September. Uh, and then we went to this camp it was sort of an instructional weekend in May that same year. And that's, you know, in the connection with the, the, the dancing, which makes sound, and also the way that um, the music and dance sort of worked together in a symbiotic way was really beautiful. And I sort of just got hooked on, on that moment. I, also, the, the unique thing about Ira was at that point in time, he was doing a show where he would present different kinds of percussive dance. Um, yeah. He sort of grouped the dance forms by their morphology, like by yeah. what they did as opposed to where they were from. So that's kind of a unique thing about his contribution. You mean like the social function of the different dances? What do you mean? Well, actually the, the task, that what the, the dance does when the dance is happening. So making sound on the floor with okay, your feet. Okay, gotcha. Um, really. So he, he had become um, really interested in trying to present these forms in conversation with each other. So so he would do a show where he would dance, maybe he would do a few old time tunes and do some flat footing. And then he would do like um, uh, some step dancing from the Southwest of Ireland maybe. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a waltz clog from Quebec and then maybe an, an English style hornpipe from Durham. And uh, seeing all these, you know, these things together, it was really nice to have them in, be in dialogue and gave a sense for the, the kind of richness of this percussive Thing that humans tend to do. <laughs> yeah. On every inhabited continent, people have figured out a way to make sound with their with their bodies um, without yeah. holding an instrument. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, I think uh, you know that that really grabbed me when I was a, a younger person, a younger student, and just became a kind of childhood obsession and then a teenage fixation. Uh, whereas I like begged my parents to drive me to West Virginia to the Augusta Heritage Weeks and, and met, met dancers there. Um, like Eileen Carson and, and Rodney Sutton, uh, who were part of Footworks and the Fiddle Puppets. Um, I later met dancers like Sharon Leahy um, from Rhythm and Shoes and Evie and Abby Layden. Um, and a lot, you know, a lot of our, a lot of the people in the old time music and dance community I encountered through these um, these festivals and through going to these weeks. Eventually, started saving up my money. I worked at the Big Boy. <laughs> 
I was a host at the Big Boy, which is like a family restaurant okay, great. in Mount Pleasant. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it sounds like a very Midwestern family restaurant. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. The it's, Big Boy. it's about as Midwestern as it gets. It's yeah. a beautiful thing. Um, so I walked, you know, and I was, of course, I was like the host. Yeah. I was like, welcome to Big Boy. Would you yeah. like smoking or not? Okay, so I, yeah. sa- I started to save up <laughs> and go to Quebec, um, which is where my teacher Sandy Silva is based. Um, she's a dancer who works with a band called Labatin Suriant and has worked for many years with Cirque du Soleil as a coach and mm. um, she's really incredible and has a, a background that's really different so could maybe in contrast to uh, some of my early teachers approaches where they would present shows and in, um, in a sort of review style um, Sandy was really interested in making original work that allowed the forms to have conversation within her own body so so it really became about the intersections and the interstices of the forms the yeah. ways that they suggested things or asked questions. Um, and I think that also was kind of influenced by her background as a dance anthropologist, um, studying and she traveled throughout Eastern Europe and went to Spain and um, was, a, was really interested in, in creating new things for her body um, that drew on these traditions. Wow, I, f- I feel like I have so many follow-up questions because <laughs> there's like a lot of, a lot that I want to like latch on to. Maybe we should play a tune first, yeah. but just I'm going to say it out loud. I'm interested in the idea of asking questions with your body. I want to know what you mean by that, because that's uh, a very resonant phrase, and I don't know why. Um, And I also want to ask about um, musicianship in dance as an extension of music as opposed to a separate thing. Okay, I'm just putting a pin in those things, because those (laughs) I want to follow up on that. But what what tune do you want to play next? Let's play... um... We're exposed to the elements here at Earful of Fiddle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't we play um, uh, Hobo, Ramblin' Hobo? Great. Yeah. One, two, three, and. Oh, false start. My fault. I should have given you a three. Uh, this is like my uh, my my attempt at trying to like reverse the tables a little bit with the dancer counting in. By all means. But it was an epic failure <laughs> the first time I tried. <laughs> Let's do it this way. One, two, three.
That's what a rambling hobo <laughs> sounds like <laughs> right there. <laughs> uh, Where, where'd you hear that tune? Uh, Joe Newberry first played me that tune. Oh, uh, Joe Newberry. Yes. He's so good. <laughs> yes. And apparently it's associated with, um, with Doc Watson. Um, I was looking, trying to find some information about it before we met. Yeah. Um, he always, he plays it often in tribute to, to Doc, which is cool. So I wanted to ask you about, um, you, you, you were talking about asking questions with your body, <laughs> um, as a dancer and that seems significant. And I want you to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, well, I, I, that kind of idea came from another teacher, actually, um, a dancer by the name of Colin Dunn, who many people know because he, um, <laughs> he had a career in, uh, commercial Irish dance shows okay. for a long time. He replaced Michael Flatley in Riverdance. That's where I've heard his name. Yeah. And then kind of mid-career, he went and did a, he did a contemporary dance degree, and he was probably ex maybe exposed, I won't, I won't speak for him, but I, I imagine in our conversations, he's alluded to this, this idea that he is asking questions through your body. And when I started to think about that a little bit more, and, and also kind of encountering... Um, not, we don't need to prop up the parasite anymore, but, but encountering the work of Michel Foucault and the way he talks about uh, bodies and power and um, difference and the, the ways that those are all kind of um, connected. It, 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 dance becomes an inherently political thing, right? Because it's, it's your most intimate part of yourself. It's your body moving. Yeah. And I think sometimes in other forms of arts, we, we have um, instruments in our hands or we're, we're somehow thinking about a visual art piece or... Um, there's some kind of thing that maybe shifts our gaze, our proverbial gaze, away from our corporeal selves. And the body then isn't always at the center. Um, but with dance, this is not the case. Sure. <laughs> dance, you know, that's, there's a kind of immediacy of the body in, yeah. in dancing. And I, I like that because um, I think it reminds us of uh, the inherent political nature of uh, what it means to make music and dance um, and how that can be like an, a really important and powerful thing how it's animated people, um, especially in rural spaces for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and I think that that can be like a really, a really special thing. Um, I, I say, or, or I say rural spaces in particular, because I'm, I'm especially interested in music and dance from rural space. Yeah. Um, especially step dancing from, there's lots and lots of kinds of percussive dance from, from all over the world. But for me, um, if we're, whether we're talking about, um, the rural American Southeast, the rural west of Ireland, um, or maybe rural Canada. These are geographies within the kind of North Atlantic that I'm, I'm particularly interested in, the music and dance from those places. Yeah. So when you're talking about uh, using your body and like, because it's focused on the body, it's inherently political, you're talking about the way that people sort of consume the entertainment. Um, I would probably say that where they engage with the engage, entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> they engage with the work or sure. <laughs> entertainment has a whole and other a more, connotation too. Yeah. But but yeah, totally. Sure. Definitely the way we engage with that is um, it's something that can can bring to light all kinds of things. But it can bring to light think, questions about like marginality. It can bring yeah. to light questions of um, uh, maybe um, social justice issues that um, are connected inherently to our bodies often because um, uh, violence has been legislated along um, bodily lines for hundreds of years, thousands yeah. of years. So I think dance becomes a, a, the center of that kind of conversation for me. Um, it also could just because I'm a dancer. <laughs> sure. That's my way of sure. engaging with that conversation. Yeah. Um, and so Colin, all, all that to say that bringing that back to, to, um, to Colin, it was like, <laughs> I remember him saying once like, if you just love to dance, like that's wonderful. I think you should just love to dance. Um, but he's kind of interested in the maybe w what you don't like about it, or like the questions you have about it, or what yeah. you know, what what uh, what about it makes you a little bit grumpy, or <laughs> what are the things in the world that you feel like um, you know could be different. And again, I don't know that dance necessarily needs to um, maybe needs to propose answers, but I think it can certainly ask questions in a nice way. Here's a question I would like to ask you. Uh, so you like traditional dance. Yes, and I do. People are traditionally uh, exclusive and bigoted sometimes. And you are engaging uh, with other people's traditions. And you're engaging with it as uh, an openly gay man. Yeah. So... Uh, 
<laughs> could you speak to that a little bit? Like, how do you, um, how, how do you participate and how does that go over? I think it's important to remember uh, that there have been queer people in all spaces. So, so sometimes there's this mythology, and I'm going to come back to this idea of uh, the rural um, sure. writ large. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to turn that into a monolithic idea, but I think that constantly um, rural space is um, somehow told that it's less than. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, taste makers, in terms of arts and culture, in terms of finances, in terms of resources that get um, distributed. Um, so, uh, uh, and I think a lot of times we, we don't think about that. I think there's a kind of what um, this author named Scott Herring calls metronormativity. <laughs> metronormativity. <laughs> which, which again That's takes a, a little good bit, word. It takes a nod from heteronormativity, right? Which yes. is this idea that yeah. anything that makes um, cisgender and heterosexuality seem, quote, normal, quote, healthy, quote, right. Um, yeah. I'm saying all that with quotation marks. Yes. Um, so, metronormativity is a similar, is a similar idea, right? Where... Um, uh, especially in, in queer narratives, we have this idea of like a young person grows up in rural space, moves to the, gets out of there as soon as exactly possible. moves yeah. to urban space, sure. quote unquote, finds themselves, uh, you know, uh, transitions or discovers they're non-binary or that they're a little bit ace or that they're gay or sure. um, yeah or that they have some kind of amazing um, and uncharted path of desire that they haven't followed. Ace meaning asexual. Yes, for the yes. people who are unfamiliar. Okay. Yeah, so I think that those narratives do a kind of violent erasure of um, queer people in, in rural spaces. Yeah. And we have to remember that, that that kind of diversity has existed, if not, it has been just as diverse, if not more diverse in in rural space. And I think of especially the work of Jack Halberstam, who's a noted queer theorist, who wrote a book called In a Queer Time and Place, in which they talk about um, the historical precedent for trans people living in rural spaces, where perhaps... You know, people, there was a lot of space. People maybe didn't ask too many questions. They gave people a little bit of a time to live the way that they wanted to and to make, yeah. to, to be who they really were and who they wanted to be. Um, and so I think it's really important to not er erase that. That said, um, it's when I look at folk festivals when I was a, a young person, sometimes um, that queerness is somehow under the radar. <laughs> um, and I didn't see an awful lot of people who necessarily, who looked like me or who, um, who I felt like I could connect with. Um, and that's really changing. Conversations are, are really changing as people become, um, those conversations open up, people can yeah. talk about their gender and sexuality yeah. um, uh, in a different way. And, and I think that's, we're in a really interesting moment for that. Um, I think it's important to keep that momentum going for all kinds of marginality. Yes. I don't think it can stop. Um, and I think um, it, this is a, a good beginning <laughs> yeah. and that makes me excited but it, it also lights a fire under me in some ways to say like okay this is we need to continue to like um, make space for marginalities that maybe we don't even have names for yet yeah maybe things that are too out there for us to even talk about um so that's a you know just trying to think about those ways that music and dance can be part of that project uh one of my favorite moments at clifftop uh was seeing jake Jake Blunt, the only, uh, as far as I know, I, still the only uh, black person to make the finals in uh, in Clifftop, at least in the traditional band contest. Um, but uh, Jake is also gay, and uh, he is not he's not coded the most gay, <laughs> as far as the gays that I've met. Um, you know, especially in the way that he dresses uh, or has dressed in the past. But when he went up on stage with his band to do um, the victory lap the year later to okay. come do a show, you know, okay. he wore a pink muscle shirt that said "Legalize Gay" on it, and uh, and I was like, "Wow, that's such a great <laughs> choice," <laughs> to, you know, because um, you know he was realizing that like I need who I am to be, uh, to be obvious in this moment because it's important. Yeah. To, um, to center a part of himself that it, people could say, Oh, it's, it's fine. You're quote, just like us. Unquote. Right. So I, I really, I, you know, I think Jake is an incredible force, um, yeah. in this scene. And I, I have a lot of love for him, but, um, I'm, I'm interested in these performances of LGBTQIA plus people in traditional music and dance in general. And that's, that's kind of, um, you know, what I, I find it, 
myself being sort of fixated on if I was going to, you know, if I'm, if I, um, was going to talk about my academic research in my master's degree, which is in something called ethnochoreology, which is like ethno Great word. musicology, <laughs> yes. but for dancing. Yes, yeah. um, it's, it, it's about LGBTQIA plus competitive Irish step dancers. So I'm really interested in the, the stories and the perspectives of queer people um, who engage with traditional music and dance. Yeah. Um, and so it, that might be um, people who are singers who use um, pronouns in an innovative way. Uh, it might be dancers who have... Um, uh, who engage with gesture in a way to um, perhaps uh, slyly or perhaps in a way that's safe for them or perhaps in a way that's not sly at all to sure. <laughs> perform their gender and sexuality. I'm interested in the stories of um, trans folk who, um, who share their music and dance um, uh, coming from, you know, Gaelic speaking islands in the Isle of Skye. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking especially mm. there about an incredible musician um, named Malin Lewis, who's from sky in scotland who's a piper and pipe maker and fiddle player um who who i just had a and did an interview with um so yeah so I'm, I'm really i have to say a little bit obsessed with those stories uh yeah. and about the ways that we negotiate our gender and sexuality through traditional mediums right traditional music and dance uh, yeah uh it's such a special place to to discuss that because um to do <laughs> to talk about it in the context of tradition, like you can't get rid of the tradition. And so you have to, you have to marry the past and the future. And most people, uh, pe people are want to say, no, I'm just going to progress and leave everything behind and like get a, as far away from it as possible. But for someone who loves traditional music and other aspects of tradition and has barriers to entry because of their, um, gender expression or or orientation like you can't just you can't get rid of either of those mm. I'm gonna I, I totally agree with you and I but I might puckishly suggest Please. that not only do you do you marry the past and the present and future you um you let them sleep together or they maybe you realize that they're already sleeping together yes. they'll just let them rub against each other a little bit because i think that it's that was, that was my heteronormative <laughs> like and they're married and match i'm sorry i wasn't gonna let that go <laughs> um, but so and and, and also in doing that politics, and yeah. also we, we in, in doing that we recognize the already queerness of so much of this work right like it's probably i might make an audacious statement now and say that like um somebody like marcus martin whose music was shared with me by another am amazing inspirational musician who I have the pleasure of collaborating with occasionally named Cleek Shry. Yeah. Um, so Marcus Martin's music to me, you know, there's a kind of, some, a kind of lonesome outsider-ness about that, that that rings as, as a pretty queer thing. Um, mm. And I think um, the, the more we can expand that circle of, of queerness um, to being um, beyondness um, and I think open it up because again, not, not everybody is lesbian or gay or bi or trans, but everybody can be queer. And I, I actually perhaps naively believe that um, queerness can can actually make us all a little bit freer because there's parts of us that don't fit into this structure um, yeah. that we've been taught we have to fit into. And as soon as we recognize that, I think we can all just be a little bit calmer and freer and wilder and more celebratory. Yeah, totally. It's like people, people who want to put up these boundaries are acting like they don't have imposter syndrome themselves of course yeah. and like as if they fit in perfectly of course you know yeah. it's like whenever i see someone who's like more marginalized than me um being more free than me it's inspiring to me mm -hmm. you know because yeah. it's like yeah i i have all of these privileges and i still feel like um yeah unable to uh express myself yeah. and i i think yeah. that that's what you know in Feminist work has been doing that for a long time, and I think queerness really owes that and it needs to be in dialogue with feminist work. Um, because, like, the more that men learn about what it means to have um, equity across gender, um, the spectrum of gender, then the better our world is going to be. Yeah. Um, and, and the happier men will be. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Not that that's the ultimate goal, but I think. No, it, free it frees us all. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Hmm. Good. <laughs> good, good things to talk about. Well, so, and people often ask me, they're like, how does that translate in a pragmatic way to like your 
shuffles. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, how does it translate into your Tennessee walking step? <laughs> you and know? you're saying it's already gay. <laughs> a little bit. I, yeah, I'm saying... Which that, I appreciate. I'm saying there, you know, there's a there's tacit queerness, you know, in every corner of our existence. But, but so an example of this for comes from um, a teacher that... Um, is a noted teacher of Irish step dancing yeah. in based in Cork, um, who frequently told her students, we'll have no scrapers in our class. Yes. <laughs> so there's a kind of petulant child in me that like, once the line is drawn there, I want my toe like just on the other side of that. So the joy of, of, of making sounds you're not supposed to make um, becomes this whole provocation. Yeah. Right? So like, for example, if I can demonstrate. Please, yeah. Um, you know, the, for example, a step like the Tennessee walking step, which comes from Robert Dodson and had, has been used by many, many dancers uh, to encounter traditional old time music. Um, generally speaking, is um, it's quite an adroit step when you learn it. So you might learn. It's like sharp, short attack okay. on the floor. But what what Peggy was suggesting, or what what she was forbidding us to do, is to maintain the connection. Yeah, with our feet to the floor. Yes. So that, to me, becomes just um, you know a, a, a sort of a queer transgression in the way that you can say like, well, what what is it like then if you take that that provocation into a step like the Tennessee walking step, where instead of going, now we have, yeah, and then we have this whole other world of timbres to play with. Um, that just, I think, broadens the, the sonic palette of what dance can do. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, yeah, but you're still engaging with tradition as you do that because you're using a traditional step and you are queer queering it. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. I also think it's, I'm not, I'm, I'm absolutely not the first person to, to do that, but uh, but for me, that, that route of um, thinking and feeling... Um, and those things collapse into each other is kind of like that was my way of kind of working with that and having my own engagement my own dialogue with the tradition <laughs> having a kind of queer encounter with it and and hmm. you know i'm thinking about all this and like so in um in old time music there can be a fair amount of like dogma about traditionalism you know um and people i think tend to adhere to it um to the extent that they're able. Um, and I, I wonder if part of that is because they're using a tool often, um, instead of, they don't not necessarily think about their own bodies, mm -hmm. but you know, and so it's like, Oh, in order to use this tool, right. You know, that I've received, like I should like do it the right way. And, um, I was thinking about like, you know, part of what I was asking you is, you know, as you're, doing progressive dance in the ways that you're doing and engaging with tradition, you know, do people ever push back mm -hmm. and, um, and do you ever feel that pressure to, uh, not, um, change things and to not challenge things, mm -hmm. but there, it, it seems like there's a urgency to do that because your instrument is your body <laughs> and you have to be yourself when you're dancing because that's how people are going to, because people are going to make assumptions about who you are mm. when they watch you dance. I think it's more interesting when, when people are moving in a way where there's kind of... Um, you could, It's like that magical thing when you watch someone do something that they've done thousands of times, right? There's a kind of integrity to the movement to watch, even if that's somebody chopping an onion or, like, creating a pot on a wheel. Like, watching someone's body in motion to do that, yes. um, there's a kind of... Um, uh, Thing that that really reads with us when we engage with that so uh, for me it's the same thing like I, i'm interested in um kind of having that kind of um that sort of employing that sort of relationship with dance um and i think also <laughs> because i'm not holding an instrument because i'm you know i'm engaging with the tradition but without a prosthesis yes. um i think i can't I actually can't hide behind that very yeah. much so there is it's kind of intense in yeah. some ways because your body is it's like um, a little bit of an exhibitionistic 
endeavor. Yes. <laughs> Not even a little. It is an exhibitionistic <laughs> it's absolutely endeavor. Absolutely. I'll just say that. I'll be open about the fact that it is. Uh, so, uh, for me... I'm a happy voyeur every time you dance. Well, you're, I mean, you're exhibiting too, right? You're, I, you, you are. I We're all, we all are performing, more, right? More than some. <laughs> um, so, I, I, I'm curious about that, and I like... I like this idea, uh, and I think it's also important to remember that that tradition. It's two things. The first is that tradition is not a bound thing. <laughs> um, that the people who um, who for whom this music and dance were their day to day, the way that they socialized with each other, um, you know, that was there was this uh, creative process involved for for lots of people. It's not like um, there was maybe perhaps an anxiety for John Hatcher about like playing the music the way he did. Mm. Maybe there was, I don't know. I'd like yeah. I'd like to imagine that um that this is it's a creative process for folks like that as well. Yeah. Um the second thing is that um <laughs> I <laughs> I have to be careful now. <laughs> um and the second thing is that I often say this to my students that the ancestors, the people who who originated this music or who who it came to us from, let's say it that way, um, are not looking down on us, judging us. <laughs> I often say this to my students in class. Um, we extend this um, imaginary umbrella of protection, sure. which will shelter our bodies not only from judgment from ourselves, which can be the, you know, the most violent source of yes. judgment, from other people in the room, and then also from the ancestors who we think maybe we're concerned about the way that they might disapprove. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to remember that, um, that these tr traditions that we're engaging with, um, and especially the ones that, that I work with, um, are, are quite robust and that they, um, there is lots of space to ask questions and explore and have an encounter. On that note, let's play another tune. Yeah. I'm in D. Do you want to play Dorigo? Yes. So we're going to play George Jackson's uh, Dorigo uh, as part of the Dorigo challenge. Hop, on, hop in on the bandwagon. <laughs> Great. Which one are we doing? Dorigo. Okay. Yeah. How does it go again? Would you, would you like to count this one off? No. <laughs> no. Thank you for the offer. I um, I, I would invite you to count off. Okay. Here's the potato.
Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for learning that. Thank you. <laughs> nice tune. You learn tunes. Yes. I, I, was, <laughs> I was playing for your class earlier, and you were teaching an arrangement of Davy, and I was like, I know where we're at in the tune <laughs> as you're teaching it. <laughs> you're repeating a section. It's like, I can hear the melody in there. You are a melodic dancer. I am a little, yeah, I'm a little bit melodically obsessed, <laughs> which is because I like, I like these melodies. I mean, that is really where it is for me. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think, I don't know, part of it has to do with my, my notion that in this imaginary village where people play music and dance together, <laughs> um, this is perhaps a utopic idea, sure, that there's sure, somebody sure. who, you know, plays, plays an instrument and we hear that instrument and we that music is kind of around us all the time yeah. and those melodies would be quite familiar to us so i imagine that when it's like oh it's time to 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 play those melodies or dance them you'd know the repertoire of your village fiddler yeah <laughs> you know sure. um so I, I like that idea um it also uh to me it, it feels like a nice way of connecting with um dancers who hold instruments <laughs> i'll say it that way yes. dancers who hold the prosthesis um that's such a I, I'm only going to identify as that for now I welcome on. you into the fold as a dancer. You're welcome. Yeah, come in. Um, so, yeah, because if you were if we're going to engage in sound making together, um, one of the things that I really like about these, these traditions um, is a, a sort of uh, focus and energy in the melody. Um, that, that, to me, is really special. And um, it's, there, there are things that I wind up singing when I'm dancing, even without someone playing. Um, I, I just made a solo show called The Art of Tree Playing, and I, <laughs> I found myself making pieces. There's eight pieces in the show, um, and I had to like kind of stop making pieces based around melodies <laughs> uh, at some point, because I made a couple of them, and um, they, you know, each piece kind of culminated in like, oh, this is a, a tune from Norway, or this is a tune called Jenny Dang the Weaver from Scotland. Or, um, so, so I had to like work really hard to like uh, not have that be the only thing in the show, and and it, right now it feels like it has traditional music has a prominent place, even though it's a solo show. Um, and so, if you like traditional music and you come to see the show, you'll you'll still get your jigs and your reels and your yeah. hornpipes in, <laughs> yes. even if it's uh, being articulated, you know, from the floor. Yeah. Um, because we don't, it's interesting, right? We don't have a, I don't have a C sharp. Or I sure, have, sure. I have clusters of pitches that probably contain a couple C sharps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it, uh, to sing a melody um, with the shoes. So I can, I can do certain things that evoke that. Yeah. And I think the constraints of that are really interesting to me. Um, even more than if I had a pitched, like my, you know, these conversations that you tend to have after a show. Where someone's like, you know what you should do. <laughs> they tend to fall, you know, it, there, there's a few possibilities that people tend to suggest. One is like, have you ever thought about making like a board with like oh, yeah, notes? Yeah. <laughs> and like, and like, you're like, what more do I have to do for you people? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I kind of, like, I kind of the, the, the pitches are there, you know, they're just, they're with a lot of other pitches. Um, and, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That that makes me laugh, uh, and and I have I mean there's there's a few kind of wonky experiments that have sure. gone on with like vocoders and keyboards and trying to dance over them like a mad scientist and yeah that but um <laughs> but for me I'm, I'm yeah I'm really interested right now at least in the in the ways that dance uh, can evoke these melodies um, just using the shoes using a pair of leather shoes on the floor yeah. um, that to me feels like a, an infinite field of play. And you are going up and down in pitch. Hey, thanks. I mean, <laughs> I yeah. mean, r r different areas of your shoes, different areas of the board. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as an instrument, they are limited, right? But they do have different timbral, you know, different things that you can do yeah. to kind of suggest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to suggest things, suggest melodies. Yeah, I mean, I feel like old-time musicians in, in general are like fiddlers are just suggesting melodies. Banjo players definitely are, so I feel mm. like that's pretty relatable. <laughs> oh, I love that idea. So, so this yeah. sense of the, the melody that we all hold, but maybe we we never articulate. Yeah, fully. That's the band. That's the like. Um, what is the word? The the platonic ideal of banjo playing is, uh, you know. Something I often don't <laughs> don't succeed at because I want to play all the notes or uh -huh. because I don't know how to, you know, um, uh, still it down, distill it down. But like a a banjo player like Hilary Burhans, you know, will take the notiest fiddle tune and play a tiny fraction of the notes 
and it's like, man, that is that tune. Mm -hmm. Like, you figured it out, how to play it, like, mm. distilled, and it's like, it's very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> So. I can absolutely relate to that in in the sense of getting really hyper obsessed about like is that a triplet or a quadruplet or like what is that and 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 um, how much accent is the bow giving you know yeah. this kind of um, on this particular upbeat at the end of this phrase um, and I, I think you know um, <laughs> my mind definitely likes to get into that space yeah but I I also understand that that's not always the best musical choice so not for always. example in in a a duo situation, perhaps, that might feel really good. It actually it doesn't always have to be in a duo. So I play in a duo with Alison DeGroote. Yes. Um, and I play in another duo with uh, an amazing Hammer Dustman player named Simon Crisman and another duo with Maeve Gilchrist. But then in an ensemble scenario, like the band like This Is How We Fly, um, or a project called Duo Duo that I work in with um, Natalie Haas and Maeve and Jan Fouquet, having the dance be melodic all the time, or actually having any of those instruments, cello, harp, guitar yeah. be melodic all the time it doesn't it actually just creates another um a, a bind for us so sure. so we're, the idea is to sort of um transfer the melody or pass it around um and hopefully reimagine the role of fiddle music in the absence of fiddling <laughs> yes <laughs> well said hmm. i need to get to g real quick let me uh let me go on over to g Go on over to G. Go on over. All right, I'm in G. So uh, we're going to do a tune that I saw you and Alison DeGroot perform. That was my first time seeing you perform live at the Ole Old time. time. Yeah, and uh, it, was really, it was really, really special. Uh, Thank you very much. I, I like you two a lot together. I love that duo. Uh, yeah, so Allison's you played this so great. You played this tune. and Now I'm playing it with you, and that makes me happy. <laughs> All right.
I did want to ask you about uh, Augusta and your time studying studying there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. At that time, um, I, I feel really lucky because I was asked to come back and teach there last year, and it was so nice to be back. Um, I think I started going to Augusta. In fact, I, I know how old I was. I was snuck in because it was a teen program that oh. Eileen Carson ran, <laughs> and I was 11, and they gave me special dispensation to come <laughs> to the program. Um, yeah, so I started going every summer. Um, uh, for various weeks, different weeks, and the great thing about that place is that there's so many musicians uh, and dancers who are local to that area. So I had an opportunity to, to meet and dance with Melvin Wine, which was really special. Oh, wow! Yeah, and and to meet oh, a, um, uh, a generation of older dancers that I mightn't have encountered, um, and in that process, um, that that's really you know was a, an introduction to a particular version of old time music. I'd had experience with old time music in Michigan. Um, but that that was a sort of a, a different regional version of what yeah. that is. Um, so that was it was a really special thing um, to be able to be um, ushered into that space, and eventually was invited to work with with Eileen's company Footworks, um, and and um, spent a few years in my teens going back and forth to Maryland where they were based. Um, did a show with them with Tim O'Brien and uh, The Crossing when that record came out. Cool. Um, yeah, so I had a lot of really um, very grateful for the opportunities that came from that. Um, and then something kind of shifted uh, somewhere along the line where I I became really interested in the um, the ways that we could move in a soloistic sense um, and the f kind of the focus and detail that could be allowed for yeah. in a, um, a soloistic way. So I'd, I also had the chance to work with... Um, Sharon Leahy and Rhythm and Shoes, um, which is another amazing, or was another amazing dance company that was um, doing the, the hard work of putting Appalachian dance on the proscenium stage um, that Footworks had also been doing um, for many, many years. And, um, uh, but when I would go into the studio alone, I, you know, there's a, a sense of maybe stretch or tone or time um, that was, that was really, um, legible in a soloistic yeah. context. Um, and so that, that became for me something that, that I, I was really interested in and I, spent, I started to spend more time uh, pursuing that. Mm. Um, and eventually that kind of led to, to working mostly with musicians and now to making these solo performances, yeah. which is kind of a newish thing for me, um, but it, it allows me to, as we spoke of earlier, ask certain questions. And um, there's two solo projects. One of them is called Solo Square Dance and it is about uh, Da dance bands, the way that um, institutions of power or governments have forbidden their subjects to dance, hmm. our citizens from dancing. So it really came out of a, um, a law that was um, enacted in Ireland in 1935. A young Irish government banned its citizens from dancing in their homes and forced them to rent a church hall, um, which would be well lit and well supervised. And it really had a, a profound impact even on the uh, the musical landscape as well as the, the dance and social landscape of the time. So to the extent that um, instruments of choice for dancing would have been fiddles and flutes at that time, quieter instruments, uh, but those instruments didn't cut through the space in a big hall. So accordions, snare drums, um, yeah. louder, louder instruments became more popular. Sure. Um, and this dance, these dance bands didn't just happen in Ireland, they happened in Canada and they happened in the United States. In huh. fact, a, a, a dance band was only recently lifted in um, Pound, Virginia, where you had to get a license to dance. 
and no license were going to be given to anyone who is not of upright moral character. So something about dancing and the power of moving bodies, I think in our present political moment, it, you know, yeah. um, it, I was really curious about that. And so I made a show, an hour long show about that, wow. that explores it in these different geographies. It takes the form of a house concert. It's always in a house. Yeah. Um, Great. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So it's in, in a domestic space. Um, and the idea is to really bring dance back into a domestic a domestic environment. And um, that's, that's solo square dance. I made another show called The Art of Tripling, which is about a specific uh, publication from two dance collectors in Scotland called Joan and Tom Flett, who wrote a chapter in a book called Traditional Dancing in Scotland called The, um, the Art of Tripling. And tripling is the Scottish word for step dancing. A lot of people aren't aware that there was an indigenous practice of step dance in Scotland. Hmm. People associate percussive dancing maybe with other geographies, yeah. but it was alive and well and actually is alive and well in Scotland right hmm. now. And so I made a show about that and about uh, what is the art of tripling. And uh, there's actual, <laughs> the book, the chapter itself is amazing. There's um, beautiful diagrams and specific and very specific instructions about the steps and also some historical and sociological information about that. Um, so these are two kind of solo performances that I'm starting to do. Uh, I find myself um, presenting more and more recently, which has been a really interesting opportunity. Yeah. Um, Unaccompanied. Accompanying yourself, self-accompanied. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah. Huh. And it's forced me to ask questions about like what other elements like sound making can happen. Yeah. Um, you know, is whistling part of that? Is is sure. clicking your fingers part of that? Is yeah. speaking part of that? I c I've come from a tradition of talkers, <laughs> so um, yeah. So that's that's in the show as well. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, so I this is normally the time of the show when I ask you know, my guests, you know, if they have anything to promote, you know, and it's often like a CD, but I don't know if <laughs> you do that. Um, so how can people um, keep up to date with you and uh, um, engage with your work? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, the the band, This Is How We Fly, has, has made two records, and we're working on our third, actually. Um, and the, we hope to have that released in, in March. Um, so in that... People ask about that. They might be a little bit incredulous, but just as much as the audio facet is present in your podcast, yes, dance becomes uh, an important part of the soundscape, the oral yeah. uh, picture, if you will, in that in those records. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that'll be that'll be out. Great. Um, and yeah, so that that project's called "This Is How We Fly," and um, I, I'm on the road on the road about thirty six weeks a year, touring and teaching. Um, so you're probably going if you're listening to this. I'll probably come see you Nick's soon. It's probably coming through, <laughs> coming through town. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yes. Yeah, I have, a, I have the great privilege of um, dividing my time between teaching, performing, and uh, working in university spaces as well. So that, that mix feels really great to me. Uh, yeah. I really like that. Hmm. Thanks, Nick. This is really uh, special to me. Um, thanks for, for your work, uh, musical and otherwise. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. Thanks for thanks for having me, and thank you for coming to Earful of Fiddle. Yeah. Um, I might uh, put a little bit of something on the ground here. Oh, please. As we prepare our final tune. Yeah. Um, this is just a little bit of sand. It's actually from Lake Michigan, um, and the sand acts as a mediator between the surface of your foot and the sound-making surface, the floor. Yeah. Uh, in a way that can conjure interesting possibilities. Um, oftentimes it, it allows for the um, that say, say sustained contact that we spoke about yes. earlier, that sense of foot to floor fricative to be even more audible. Foot to floor fricative. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you'll hear, you might hear that. Um, so I might, uh, I might sprinkle some here and you can just hear the sound of the chair being moved and then a little bit of yeah. sand here. Yeah, I can go. <laughs> Go to the beach after we change into our bathing suit. Have a great time. <laughs> and we're gonna swim also. Oh, fun. Jealous. <laughs> this is such a kid friendly <laughs> camp for people who yeah. are looking for a camp to bring kids to. Kids of all ages. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're right next to the beach, actually. You can see the beach from here. Alright. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to jig. <laughs> Thank you. 
Nick Garris has a free performance in Lansing on July 18th. I included a link in the show notes with details along with links for his website where you can find the rest of his performance dates and projects and the website for his band This Is How We Fly, which you should like and follow on Facebook. Thanks again to Elderly Instruments for sharing the show on social media. You can visit their online store at elderly.com. And thanks again to Earful of Fiddle Music and Dance Camp for having me out to record their instructors. Do not miss it next year, earfulloffiddle.com. If you want to hang out with me twice a week, I have another podcast called Think Outside the Box Set. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. That's all for now, friends. Thank you for listening. Come back same time next week to get up in the cool.